Hi guys, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be in the world. I'm Dr. Dan Nightingale, your Clinical Dementia Specialist. Thank you for uh, watching this video today and I'm joined by my wife, practice manager and overall handler, Lynn. Hi Lynn. Hello. Thank you for helping me with this today. There's some questions come up and they're, pre they're, they're quite clinical questions. And they're about certain situations and certain things that people living with a cognitive change, such as Alzheimer's disease or vascular dementia or Lewy body dementia, are experiencing. And so these questions I thought I would answer today. And as I said, they are clinical, but I'm going to try and make it as understandable as possible. One of the things that people have been asking me about is something called agnosia. Now, agnosia, there are three different types. There, are, there is a visual agnosia, there is an auditory agnosia, and there is a tactile agnosia. Okay. What is it? Well, it's kind of an inability to recognise and understand something that is happening. So, as I look at Lynn now, I know her face, I know who she is. I know what she's doing there, and I recognise her. With, with visual agnosia, people struggle to recognise a face. So an example, I could have somebody with a visual agnosia walking through the marketplace and their daughter walking in the opposite direction and they pass each other and he doesn't know who that is, unless he hears her voice. He doesn't recognise the face, but when she says, hey dad, he's like, oh Charlotte, how are you doing? That's when he recognises her, through the voice, but not the face. You know, prosop agnosia is where that really happens. They don't recognise that face. And if I look in the mirror, I might not even recognise my own face, don't know who I am. Now, as you can imagine, this can be anxiety provoking, it can be very frightening, and it can be an experience that really impacts negatively on that individual. How do we manage it? What do we do about it? It's very difficult because there's no cure. There's nothing we can do to change the, the situation. What we need to do is think about changing the environment. And if somebody's at home alone, and we know they experience agnosia, let's put a towel over the mirror. Just, just when that person's on their own. At night time, maybe, something like that. Cover the mirror, but take it off again. Don't keep it covered all the time, because that can be counterproductive. So that's one example of managing a visual agnosia. What about an auditory agnosia? Obviously, this means hearing. You can hear people talking, but not really understanding what they're saying. It's not, um, it's not like receptive aphasia. It's not a, a fact of not being able to understand what the person's saying because of that, but because of the agnosia, they don't really understand what those words mean, what that person is saying. What do we do about that? That makes it, again, very, very complex as a challenge. But what we do is make sure that when we're talking to that person, having a conversation with that person, maintain eye contact, maintain engagement with that person. Don't walk away, don't move away. Just focus on that individual and that conversation and speak clearly and ensure that that person has heard what you've said. And you might be able to validate, clarify by using some kinds of symbols or um, representation, symbolic representation in shapes and things like that. And then the third one, the tactile, is I can I can feel this pen, I, I can see this pen and I know it's a pen, okay? But I can't feel the shape of it. I can't, 
I don't know what shape that is. Okay? I don't, don't know it. Same with a cup, it could be a cup. Don't know the shape. I know it's a cup, and I know what's in the cup, but I don't feel it. You know, I can't feel the shape of it. So I can't tell the difference between a triangle and a circle, because I can't feel it. I can't, I can't do it, only by visual can I do it. So just imagine those things happening. You know, you go to the zoo, and you're looking at a giraffe, but you have no idea what it is. You have no idea what animal that is you're looking at. And it's a giraffe, and you've seen a giraffe millions of times before. Or an elephant, or a dog, or a chicken, or whatever it may be, but not being able to recognise it. So when you say to somebody, what is it? You're like, don't know, what is it? Well, it's a giraffe. Well, okay, you've told me what it is, but I'll probably forget. You know, so they won't retain that information, they won't retain that memory, that that is a giraffe. So you might have to say that every single time you go and see a giraffe. Very important when we are carrying out a cognitive function assessment to understand that that person has that condition. Because on one of the tests, it asks you to name three animals. One is a lion, one is a rhino, and one is a camel. But if you don't recognise them, you can see them, but if you don't recognise it, then you're going to lose three points, which would be then maybe regarded as part of your cognitive decline, as part of a neurocognitive disorder. And even though I started off by saying some people with uh, Alzheimer's disease, vascular dementia, Lewy body dementia, experience this, this kind of situation, it can happen to anyone, any one of us. We don't have to have a neurocognitive issue or a neurological issue for this to happen, okay? It, it could happen from a brain injury, right? So those are some of the things I've been asked about and I hope that helps clarify that. And at some point we may do a, a, a whole video on how to manage it, how to work with people, how to support people with agnosia. I have a question. Yes. How common is this? Very rare. Okay. The prevalence rates, I couldn't tell you, but it's very rare. We don't see it very often. So some might experience it, probably not most. Yeah. Would it come and go? Would it increase no. in intensity? No. Once it comes, it's, it's there. It doesn't come okay. and go. Okay. It's the part of the brain that's damaged that is responsible for that is damaged and we can't fix that okay we just manage um, it the the bigger the the more the disease if we're talking about a neurocognitive issue the more the neurocognitive decline takes place the riskier the prevalence rate will increase okay okay cap grass syndrome Spell, please. P-L-E-A-S-E. -E. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't resist that. Capgrass syndrome, C-A-P-G-R-A-S, otherwise known as imposter syndrome. So what is that? I mean, what is that all about? Okay, so here is, um, here is a lady living in her house. She's 83. Here is her husband living in the house. He's 83. They've been married for 60 years. The phone call I receive is, there's a man in my house. Who is it? What is he doing here? Okay. What does he look like? Describe him to me. Well, he's this, he's this, he's this, he's this. Well, that's Billy, your husband. Is it? Really? Yes, that's Billy, your husband. I don't think it is. I don't, that's not my husband. That's not him. That's not Billy, my husband. So that's, that's Capgrass syndrome, imposter. You think there's somebody imitating somebody else. And sometimes you might not recognize that person as being your daughter or your son, your husband, your wife, just as in that example. So 
All we can do with cat breast syndrome, and again, it's rare, couldn't tell you the prevalence rates, but it's a rare um, symptom of neurocognitive disorder and neurodegenerative disease. It's rare, but it happens. And the, the way to manage that effectively is reassurance, reassurance, reassurance. And that is really all we can do because it doesn't happen all the time. Sometimes you may recognize that person as being your husband or your wife or your son or your daughter. Other times, may not. So that's cat grass, that's imposter syndrome. Lynn? So is an example of cat grass syndrome, would that be um, her mistaking her daughter as her mother? No. That's something totally no, different. it's totally different. Okay. Um, because that happens too, right? Yeah, that happens too when we, we think that that's my son or that's my mother or that's my daughter or my grandma or whatever it is when really it isn't it's some other relative. And this is an interesting, this is, this is a topic for another video, I think, because this is an interesting thing for me clinically, because you can have a guy who has Alzheimer's disease with three daughters. And he can recognize two daughters, but has no idea who the third daughter is, or the second daughter, or the first daughter, but he knows the other two. And from a clinical, clinically, that is of great interest to me. So I think, Linda, I'm, I'm really glad you raised that because I think that is a topic for a video on its, on its own um, because it is a clinical challenge and it impacts on people emotionally at a deep emotional level. And I think we need to talk about strategy for, for managing that. Okay. But, so yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's a good thing. So back to Capgrass, to manage it, not to correct the person. Right. Avoid correcting them, right. but it's all about reassurance and making them feel secure hmm. and comfortable and lowering anxiety and surrounding that. Absolutely. That's the thing, the fear, the anxiety, as we, we've spoken about before, this is a good time to use the Nightingale Dementia Triangle, you know, where we, where we um, manage the fear and anxiety and dampen it down. And how about reinforcing, um, what do you call it, um, biographical memory about looking at photo albums and looking at memories and recognizing family members in photos that could help yeah. reinforce it's a good who people are. Yeah. It's a good thing to do that on a regular basis, not just when that person's experiencing well, right, right. this. So it's a good thing to do that regularly. So the, the brain does have the opportunity to lay down a memory about that person or about that event. And this is, guys, this is why I always tell my patients, relatives, if you're having a conversation about something, then record it, make a little video. If you've gone out and experienced it, been out for dinner, been out to the park, been out to the zoo, wherever you may have been, take a video, video it. And then sit down with, with that individual and share it and say, hey, look what we did today. Look, look at that, look what we saw, look what we had for dinner. Share it and um, so that can help alleviate any anxiety and fear at any time, at any time. And people saying, I haven't been, I haven't seen my son for three weeks. Or you don't take me anywhere or we don't right. do anything. I haven't seen my kids for ages. They never come, they don't bother. Well, hang on, look at this video. Remember this from yesterday. Look, this is what happened yesterday. Oh, oh yeah, okay. It can be a memory jogger. The person might not have memory of it because of course we're we're talking about neurodegenerative disease here, so the, the memory might not be there. But the reinforcement of your kids love you, your kids support you, or your husband, your wife, whatever, support you, they love you, they, they, they see you often, they support all, all you the You were having a good doing. time, you right. were smiling, right. you were laughing, make photo books. Right, because of course, you know, that's the time when they're benefiting from the experiences at that moment, that present moment in time. 
Okay. And it's okay to relive it. Oh, over and over and over again. Absolutely. And reinforcing the relationships and oh. the love and support of your family. Yeah, over and over and over again, as many times as you want. Right. Absolutely. Um, and then the last one I wanted to briefly mention is something called Charles Bonnet syndrome. Charles dash B O N E T. Charles Bonnet syndrome, which was identified first by Dr. Charles Bonnet. So that's why it's called that. This is a this is an interesting phenomenon. And we don't have to have any kind of neurocognitive or neurological disorder for this to happen. It happens as we age. It happens as we begin to lose our vision. So people who start to go blind, macular degeneration maybe, or just because there's eye disease or there's damage and the person goes blind, they experience hallucinations. And these hallucinations can be quite negative and horrific. So even though they can no longer see, they, they experience these hallucinations. And one example I can give you from a patient is hallucinations that are all these weird, strange, ugly, monstrous looking faces that come right up close to the person. It's as though they're right there in front of their face. So, you know, that can be horrific. It can be anxiety provoking. It can induce fear. It can induce aggression. It can induce agitation and a, an unwanted behavioral response. So it's really important that we understand that that's what that person is experiencing. And they can tell you, they'll tell you, this is what I'm experiencing. This is what I see. Um, so just like any, any kind of visual hallucination that we spoke about earlier with agnosia, then it's something that we need to support and help the person work through. And we did a separate video on hallucinations uh, last week or the week before. And so there is information out there about managing and supporting hallucinations. So that's what I wanted to address today because those are the questions that came up. So thank you ever, ever so much for supporting me for supporting the channel please please share this information share this video share it with friends with family get people to subscribe to the youtube channel get people to follow instagram because every day we post things on there all educational all shareable information and knowledge makes the world a better place so fantastic have a wonderful rest of the week and uh, you can find me at drdanielnightingale.com, obviously the YouTube channel, um, Instagram, Facebook, any questions, please send them in. And remember, dump the soda.